Stuart, can you talk about what it means to live without generating karma? To live without what? Generating karma that you have to work out. Generating karma. I can't talk about something you can't do, so I don't know what to say. I mean, every act, everything you do generates some kind of karma. Good karma, not good karma, you know. So you can't live in this world without generating karma. So it's to learn how to instantly release. Excuse me, what's the question? You're answering your own question, Shiko. What is your question? How do you deal with the karma that you generate? But I know you've answered this a million times. <laughs> well, here's a million and one. Uh, I, uh, you know, look, you know, karma is not a negative thing. Karma is just our everyday activity, our actions, how we live in the world, you know, how we interact with other people, what we learn from life. And, you know, how, how do you get free of karma? You get free of karma by experiencing all kinds of experiences in this world, and then having a system inside that enables you not to get swept away in those things, to just detach yourself from them. You know, and I mean, that's, you know, you get free of karma by, you know, interacting with the world with compassion, with love, with joy, with consideration for other people, you know, those kinds of activities free you of whatever karma you have built up in your life. If you act, interact with people and it's all negative and angry and, you know, bullshit and crying and complaining and all it does is build more karma. You know, because if you truly have developed an inner life, and your interactions with the world reflect your connection with higher energy in the universe. That energy is not going to flow through you if your heart is closed, if your mind is closed, your brain, your sexual energy, you're, you're not grounded in the third chakra. That energy doesn't flow through you. So what you interact in the world with is ego, tension, opinion, what's right, power, and that just builds more karma. And then you got to reincarnate to work out all the karma you developed in this lifetime. I mean, you don't work out your karma by sequestering yourself, by creating barriers between yourself and life. It's not a way to work out karma. You work out karma by embracing life and just allowing it to be your teacher, not your enemy. Whatever takes place, it is teaching you about yourself and what you have to do to grow. And if you approach life that way, then you, you know, you're not going to develop more karma. You're going to listen, you're going to learn, you're going to grow, you're going to get closer to God, you're going to get closer to your enlightenment. That's a kind of nice way to live. Instead of bitching and complaining about everything and, you know, angry and taking out your insecurity on other people. 
being right all the time. I mean, that's a terrible way to live, you know? Just create walls around yourself. Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? Thank you, that was great. Dude, I was gonna ask you to talk about enlightenment and then, and then you even mentioned it. Could you speak a little bit directly about enlightenment? You know, the answer is very simple. I've said it a thousand times. Happy people are enlightened people. People that live every day with their hearts open, full of love, full of compassion. I mean, they really have attained the highest state of what it means to be a human being on this planet. They, they really have learned what we are born here to learn. Literally, how to transform all the suffering and the pain and the difficulty into joy, into love, into happiness. And all the swamis, they're less, you know, they always have an ananda, you know, <laughs> attached to their names. You know, ananda means bliss. I mean, happy people are enlightened people, but finding happy people is not an easy task. Because most people spend all their time in their heads, their emotions, their, and they create so much conflict inside themselves that there's no room for happiness or at least sustained happiness. You know, if they win the lotto, they get very happy, you know? Something good happens, they get a raise, a job, and, you know, they fall in love, they get happy. But it's never sustained happiness, it always, kind of peters out after a certain amount of time. So what I'm talking about is sustaining happiness. And I really believe that's what we're on the earth to learn, how to be happy people. Because to learn that, you gotta learn how to transform all the negativity, the pain, the tension, the suffering into an open heart. And you become, when you do that, you become a child of God living here. I mean, what's wonderful about this is that it's possible to do. It really is, you know? And it really is the central focus point. It really is what this meditation is all about. You know, we don't get grounded in the third chakra or second, whatever people call it, you know, below the Bahada, you know, in order to just build foundation. We get grounded there so that we have the inner capacity to keep our hearts open, to keep our minds quiet. That's the reason for that. Not just to build, you know, a parking lot, you know. <laughs> you know, it, it has a purpose. The purpose is to live with an open heart, to have the strength to live and sustain joy and love, kindness, compassion, caring for oneself and other people. You need foundation for that. You need training, you need grounding for that. Just getting your mind below the navel is not the end product. The end product is a quiet mind, an open heart, throat open, sexual energy being channeled to activate Kundalini. And all of those things bring about enlightenment.
Does anyone else have a question? Who would like Thank to? you. You're welcome. And honestly, I always say it, I'll say it again. You know, enlightened people don't know they're enlightened. They just live that way. Their lives are lived in service to God, with love, with compassion for other human beings. They just live that way. You know, they don't walk around with a sign around their neck saying, I'm enlightened. You know? It's just their very presence, their being, the way they live their life, the service they do in the world, the joy, the love, the kinds of things they talk about, you know, uh, determine how developed their consciousness is and how enlightened they are. And you don't even know you're enlightened which is really good, you know? <laughs> Otherwise, you're gonna walk around broadcasting how evolved you are. I mean, I knew somebody once who told me they belong to some organization of supposedly enlightened people. And it just seemed scary to me, you know, that they pick and choose who's enlightened and who's not, you know? It just seemed like uh, something very dangerous. Does anyone else have a question they would like? You know, it's that wonderful story in Japanese Zen about this monastery, the abbot in the monastery dies and they have to choose a new abbot. And all the wise men and all the, you know, the monks get together and nobody can choose an abbot because none of them were living in the moment and it, all of their development was in their heads. And they, and they finally saw these two guys, I always forget their names, but the Japanese paint them a lot. And their job was to kind of mop the floors and <laughs> you always see them with this bliss on their face, totally living in the moment. You know? And they became the abbots for the monastery. They didn't know they were enlightened. They just were totally immersed in life and, you know, full of joy and love and, you know, they became the abbots, these two guys. And they're very famous. You see them painted all the time in Japanese art. I forgot their names. <coughs> I used to have paintings of them. They just, you know. <laughs> Needed an incredible the way they were depicted with brooms and mops in their hands. You know, they became the abbots of the monastery. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's that Japanese saying, that wonderful Zen saying before enlightenment, carrying water and plowing the fields. After enlightenment, carrying water and plowing the fields. <laughs> it's so true, you know, it's so true. <laughs> Except that there's a line you cross, one you do it unconsciously and the other you do it consciously <clears throat> with an open heart, with love, with, you know, embracing life. Does anyone else have a question they would like to? I used to love those Japanese Zen sayings. <clears throat> Once had a painting of a staff. It was really a great painting by, done by a famous Japanese Zen monk. And <clears throat> there was scripture on both of the staff, both sides of the staff. Those that are on the path get hit with the staff. And those that are not on the path get hit with this staff. <laughs> you know, I mean, I thought it was just a scream. 
because it's true, you know? Whatever your position in life is, there's always something that's gonna test you. Do you do it with joy and love and openness and use it to get closer to your enlightenment? <clears throat> or do you just do it like a schmuck and you suffer like a schmuck? Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? <laughs> okay, I, you know, as I announced earlier, there'll be no class tomorrow. I have to have treatment, which I'm getting about every two months now, you know? And uh, there'll be, there will be a class on Wednesday. And in all sincerity, God bless you all. And thank you for being here, for participating in this, for using this meditation to grow in your life. Because, you know, the truth is, your presence here is really helping me to grow. And I'm just very grateful for that. And I just can't tell you the depth it takes me to to just share all the things I've learned in my life with all of you. So bless you all and thank you. And there'll be a class on Wednesday and everybody have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you, Stuart. Good night. Thank you, Stuart. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Good night.